So I don't think that water identifies death in the same way that we do because water never dies. We can call it dead water. We have these terms for polluted water that hasn't got you know, good structure in these things, but that's a word we've given it. But it always evaporates. This is Veda Austin, and you're listening to The Lifestylist Podcast. The Vibration of Sound Between Your Ears is episode 410. It's called The Secret Intelligence of Water as the Liquid Language of God with Veda Austin. You can find show notes for this episode at lukestory.com slash Veda, V-E-D-A. Our guest, Veda Austin, is a New Zealand water researcher, author, artist, and mother of three. For nearly a decade, she's been photographing water in a state of creation, the state between liquid and ice that she believes is responsive to consciousness. Veda views this important phase from three perspectives. Scientifically, water is becoming a liquid crystal. Artistically, water is free to design. And from a spiritual level, water enters a phase of fluidity between space and time and is, in fact, in a space of becoming. Her desire to find a unifying force that upheld the principles of life, nature, and the cosmos manifested when she began her journey with water at the deepest levels. Inspired by the genius of Victor Schauberger, Marcel Vogel, Theodore Schwenk, and Rudolf Steiner, Veda embraced a Gothian approach, weaving science with phenomena-based learning and years of refined observation. For her, water is not limited. It enters the bodies of people as freely as it enters the bodies of ants. It can be found in the heavens as well as the earth, and it never dies. It's always reincarnating between liquid, solid, and gas. In summary, Veda believes water is flow. It does what it is. Now, this is a wildly meandering conversation, and one that was not only deeply moving for me, but also incredibly inspiring. Now, as a fanatic of all things water, this was truly one of my all-time favorite Lifestylist podcast interviews, so I'm really excited to share this one. Now, I want to get right into the episode, so I'll just broadly tease a couple of the topics covered therein. The beautiful story of Veda's healing experience with water, how Veda's method differs from that of Dr. Emoto, how she was influenced by Victor Schauberger's work on living water, Gerald Pollack and the fourth phase of water, Veda's take on water restructuring devices like Leela Quantum, Soma Vedic, and Natural Action, how music influences water, distilled versus mineralized water, the relationship between water and light, the fact that water is in fact a conscious being, the relationship to water between ancient and indigenous peoples. We also talk about the purpose of human tear ducts and so many other fascinating stories about water in general. I'm really excited to share this with you. And it's my guess that as we get into this episode, you're going to want to get a visual representation of Veda's work. So I highly recommend that you check out the show notes at lukestory.com slash Veda. Um, we get into, of course, describing on the video interview and the audio interview some of Veda's work, but it, it truly does need to be seen. So we've got some links to her work there, as well as some of my favorite images that she's created as an artist and researcher on water. So with that, my friends, let's get into this deep dive of a conversation with none other than Veda Austin. Veda Austin, so great to meet you. Thank you for coming by the studio today. This is my absolute pleasure. I'm so stoked. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I've been following your work for a few months, I guess now, and I'm just continually flabbergasted by how fantastic and interesting it is. As someone, uh, anyone that listens to this podcast on a regular basis knows that I'm a water fanatic, um, all aspects of it and especially the mysterious nature of its consciousness. So when I found your work, I was just like, what? Yeah, We've got to talk. And uh, I'm so, uh, it's so fortuitous that you were able to stop by here live in the studio. I always find it's much more um, engaging in the flesh. So thank you. It's like, it's, it just worked out perfectly and some things are meant to be. So it's interesting that you would even talk out loud about water having consciousness because a lot of people are very unwilling to even talk about water and consciousness in the same breath. 
And yet what I've seen is that water is really communicating rather than conforming to consciousness. And for anyone that has followed Masaru Emoto's work or has some idea that our consciousness impacts water structurally, then this work that I've been doing really kind of takes it another step further. And it really does suggest after somewhere in the region of 36,000 photographs of seeing water respond not only to consciousness, but its environment, to words and music and thoughts even, and having intelligent responses in two different ways. One, in imagery that you can recognize as an image that's relative to the influence, like the thought of a hand, you'll see a hand in the ice. To some new work that I've been doing, which is really pretty much next level amazing, uh, that I call hydroglyphs, which is essentially a language of water that I'm identifying, which we can get into um, because it's repeatable. And to get one hydroglyph, which is essentially a symbol in ice that I've seen multiple times, uh, I use words. So, for example, I'll write the word creation. I'll put my Petri dish of water on top of the word, freeze it using my technique, which we can also talk about, take it out and take a photograph of what I see. And each time I do that, I will see a specific image. And I have to have done that at least 50 times and seen the same image appear to say I have one hydroglyph. And so each hydroglyph has a layered meaning of which people around the world are actually helping me to identify. And after four years of working in this area of hydroglyphs specifically, I have got around about 35 glyphs, which doesn't sound like a lot for four years of work, but when you consider how often you have to do so many multiple tests, it's actually, it's actually pretty amazing because then you're starting to like read real messages that are conceptual and they have a very big overlap with hieroglyphs and that they're conceptual meanings that are not designed to be spoken, but are designed to be so felt. And so it's, a, it's really, really difficult it, it, to start really interpreting this work because it's kind of like um, discovering Egypt for the first time and figuring out what hi, you know hieroglyphs are and figuring out how they all work. It is this incredibly sophisticated language where the invisible has become visible, which is what I'm seeing where liquid becomes ice. And within the ice, there is so much information. Wow. <laughs> it sounds like there are so many directions I could go. Luckily, I, I have my trusty <laughs> list, so I don't forget anything. Sometimes I, I don't even look at it, but um, as I was taking the notes for this, I was like, oh God, I have so many questions. Um, but I think it'd be kind of neat to start with your story of how you had this healing experience with water. I, I did. after After the accident and stuff, I've heard you tell that story once and it's just fascinating. Yeah. I think that might be a jumping off place as we lead into some of the nuances of what else you've discovered. Sure. It was about 25 years ago now, and uh, the driver and I, we basically we went under a seven-ton truck, rolled twice, um, and the driver died instantly. And I had eight surgeries over the course of some, uh, quite a long time, like 20 years. And on my eighth surgery for bowel surgery, because the seatbelt had gone across my waist and crushed a lot of my internal organs, um, they found that I just didn't recover well and I had showers of blood clots in my lungs and the doctors wanted me to be on warfarin, which is a blood thinner for potentially the rest of my life. And I've always made very conscious choices from a very young age uh, to really take care of my body. And so I was actually kind of shocked that my body had, had this had happened to it. And I, I always knew my body could heal itself. And so, however, I was really fed the fear, you have to, you have to do this or you're going to die. And so I took warfarin for three months or so and then had an x-ray, no more clots. 
And so I made a conscious decision for myself. And of course, I believe everybody should have a choice about what they do with their body. And I decided that I would become the guinea pig of my own health and really just see what I could do to stay as healthy as possible. And so I had a friend who was a medical doctor, but also practiced, practices Ayurvedic medicine. And he said, look, you know, this might seem really simple, but what if you start drinking a naturally high alkaline water and it might help to reset your body? So I thought, well, that's got to be, that's easy. Like even our rainwater in New Zealand is like a 7.3 around about that. And so I started trialing myself on two-week trials on different types of naturally alkaline water. And so other than feeling hydrated, I didn't really notice anything specific. But I had a wellness center at the time and a, a client came to me and she said, I know this old guy and he's just giving his water to cancer patients. It's from a very deep underwater aquifer and the pH, which stands for potential of hydro hydrogen, is 9.9. .9. And I'm like, God, that's the highest, most alkaline water I've even heard of. Um, I, I really have to try this. And so I went to see him and he gave me a month's worth of water to try. And after day three, I really noticed a change in which, and a topic that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but after talking at an event like over the weekend, there was a lot of talk, doctors talking about poop. And so this is a really good indication of your internal health. There are so many people sitting on the toilet trying to push out a pebble for an hour and they are just grossly dehydrated. And so I'd had so much bowel surgery that after day, on day three, I think things are really working well here. This is, this is something I'm noticing that is different. But on day 10, I noticed something really crazy going on. Um, I had all these bumps coming up along my arm and jaw that were really painful and I knew my body was purging but I didn't exactly know what it was purging and although it sounds gross um, there was this big kind of angry lump that felt really painful like sharp and so I ended up getting some tweezers and like digging into my arm and I pulled something out and it was this little shard of green glass and I'm like oh my God, I actually know where this is from. On Between day 10 and 12, 27 pieces of green glass came out of my arm and my jaw with a little assistance from some tweezers. And they had been in my body for over 20 years because the man who died in the car accident, he had had a nightclub. And in the back of his car were crates of Steinlager beer I know my accent is really strong. It's a <laughs> like lot a of grizzly bear? Like, no. no, everybody says that. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. I, I was already with you because of the green glass. I get it. I used yeah. to drink some beer. Okay. Anyway, so um, I was like, oh my God, you know, this, this has been in my body this long. How can just drinking this water, like, make my body do that? And I was in a little bit of disbelief and I was extremely curious and I gave Sue some to my dad who's kind of a famous Maori fisherman in New Zealand his name's Bill Hohepa and when he started to drink it um, he had been many many years prior he had actually got a, a bit of the um, spike from a fish a spike from the fin between his knuckles and he thought he'd pulled it all out. But after drinking the water, this leftover bit of what looked like a fossilized, gross bit of fin started making its way out from between his knuckles. And I'm like, there's really something to this. And I trialed all these people um, on the water from my wellness center. And everybody, without exception, had some kind of positive result from just people who are very healthy, who had more energy, to people that really had some chronic problems. One man, um, actually, he had stage four cancer and he was not wanting to try everything he could prior to going on the chemo uh, track. And so he did a 27-day water fast and only drank that water. 
And he was tested halfway through the fast and they saw that his tumor had reduced by half. And to him, that was like miraculous, but the doctors didn't really give him that much encouragement about it. He was, they was like, well, what did you do? He said, I'm on a water fast. And they were concerned about that. But he was, it was his decision. And two weeks after he'd finished the whole fast, he was completely cancer free and he still is. And so that really spoke volumes to me. And then his, he went to an integrative um, medical doctor uh, who who actually contacted me and said, I, I want to know more about this water. I want to to try my pace, patients on if they're open to doing water fasts. And so everybody who tried the water, their eyesight improved. One person had to even change um, the prescription of her glasses. And so it, that really made me realize that I was working with what I call a medicine water. And I think that there are medicine water sources around the world. And this one just happened to be one uh, that was in my own country of New Zealand that across the board seemed to make massive differences in people. It tasted different as well. It had a, a consistency that was slightly more viscous. And it I've, I had it tested also for exclusion zone for that fourth phase water that Gerald Pollock talks about. And he says that spring water that comes deep, deep down from a spring in an aquifer is under a lot of pressure and pressure helps to build this exclusion zone water. So I knew I was working with high quality water um, and that's what my body needed. So it wasn't that... Um, only that water is going to help heal people, but a lot of people eat a lot of acid foods and they have a lot of issues going on. And somehow this water was able to just get people into a balanced space. And so I would always say to them, if you're going to drink this type of water, um, make sure you do it be at least an hour before or after eating food. So there was a protocol as well that was um, that I used for the specific quarter, and so I wanted to like learn more about it because it's like is it because it's high alkaline? Is it because of the bicarbonate? Is it this? Is it that? The other? Is it that underneath this massive aquifer, aquifer with this incredible quartz crystal bed? Uh, probably that probably helped. But what I think eventually I started to look into was Tesla's quote. You know, if you want to find the secrets to the universe, look in frequency, vibration, energy. And when you think about water, and a lot of people go to the analysis, what's in the water? We're so fascinated. By That's what, already where I it. went, like reductionist, you know, like mm-hmm. it must have high magnesium bicarbonate or uh, um, a, a strong ORP. It did have, or something like that. I mean, you know? it did have, have, have a, I think that negative um, ORP was negative 298 or something like that. And ORP is something that definitely was part of that um, healing aspect, I believe. Interesting. Um, but when you take out what's in water, what are you really left with? Like, what is water? I mean, we tend to go into, oh, it's H2O, you know, it's just hydrogen and oxygen come together and that's really it. But what I've seen in my work is that water has what I term an energetic state of health, just like we do. And so what I started to realize is that this particular water had a certain type of frequency or vibration. Not that I have gone out and actually been able to measure that, but the measurement really was in everybody's response. I tend to think of um, myself and people as having their own song. Our Each molecule has its own kind of tone and frequency, and then we have this orchestra, this humongous trillions and trillions of cells which work together like an orchestra. And so when I started to drink this water, what it felt like for me is that I had a new player 
that went into each cell and informed it that there was something missing. And that then really created this new tone, this new song within me that was able to recognize things that weren't supposed to be there. And just like an opera singer can sing a high note and like shatter glass, it was kind of like that's what happened in my body as this water literally purged everything to the surface that wasn't supposed to be there. And I had a massive energetic change. And it's interesting because what it also made me realize is that there is more to water than just hydration, just something that takes our waste away, just something that, you know, we take for granted that we bathe in and swim in and all these things. And it led me on to the journey of what, how can water store information, like what information was held in that water that I needed to hear? that I needed to know, that I needed to feel, and that seemingly a lot of people did. (laughs) And that then led me on to the work of, you know, so many people have heard of Masaru Emoto, although clearly he was not embraced by the scientific community. What do you think the beef was? Because I I got that book, The Hidden Messages in Water, I think when it came out or shortly after and made perfect sense to me, but, you know, kind of an earthy, far out guy. Uh, But what what was the... (laughs) skeptical kind of scientific communities beef with his work what what holes did people uh, shoot in it exactly well he was always pretty open about it he never misled anyone but he took they took a many 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 photos and chose the best photos to share so it wasn't like it was consistent we're seeing this perfect crystallography in every single one ah, i see so that was an issue but What I think his work really did was open the door for people to see themselves as bodies of water that are sensitive to thoughts, sensitive to environment, um, and like a a kind of liquid crystal antenna where we're bringing in information from the external world and bringing it into this internal world. And so what his work, which was very much seen in contrast, really did was make people more aware of themselves, of bodies of water. Whenever we cut ourselves, we leak. At our highest and lowest moments, tears come out of our eyes. We sweat, we urinate. You know, we really are so much fluid, but because we're contained in the skin, in this kind of meat suit, we don't tend to see that about ourselves. And um, imagine if our skin was transparent, right? <laughs> we like we would we would see each other as we really are, which is basically like sacks of water, mm-hmm. essentially. I've been into energetic healing technologies for many years, especially those that are supportive for EMF exposure. And there are a lot of so-called quantum products on the market, and I've tried just about any one I've ever heard of, but few of them have had any noticeable effect. However, there is one product line that's passed my test and become part of my arsenal, and it's called Leela Quantum Tech. Leela Quantum has developed a groundbreaking technology to increase your energy level, become more stress resistant, and also helps to support your whole family, pets, and garden with pure quantum energy. The Leela Quantum products have been certified and studied by various third-party institutes and doctors. And these studies have proved and these studies have found significant improvements in people's blood, cellular voltage, allergy reduction, and heart rate variability. But my favorite benefit of all is that the Leela Quantum products help neutralize harmful frequencies, including any EMF like 4G, 5G, microwaves, and Wi-Fi. In fact, I have the Leela Quantum Block in my kitchen where I charge my food, drinks, and supplements, as well as the Infinity Block in my living room and here in the studio for a huge energetic upgrade. Leela Quantum Tech is a truly conscious business that wants to do good in the world and even plants a tree for every order. So if you want to get on board, you can get 10% off your first order by visiting leelaq.com and using the discount code 10LUKE. That's L-E-E-L-A-Q.com. And the new customer discount code is 10LUKE. I think about it sometimes uh, where if a body is cremated, you know, you have a six foot two, 200 pound male dies, 
gets cremated. And then afterward, you have a little urn of, I don't know what, carbon or whatever the ash is that's left over, right? It's like, well, where did the rest of that physical structure go? It evaporated. (laughs) There's water, right? It's like turned to steam and it's now it's wherever steam goes. Yeah. It's super weird. But you're talking about one of my favorite topics and you've touched on something really important. Actually, it's been identified that the ashes are salts after you're cremated. And given that we are an ocean, we're not fresh water, we're salt water. And salt is also one of my passions because I'm always interested in what, what we're essentially made of. If you pardon the pun, boiled down, we are water, salts, minerals, and consciousness. And the way in which salt and water work together in this incredible synergy of information storage, um, we don't tend to think about what, within all of our technology, there is uh, a crystal, the crystal storing information. Quartz stores vast amounts of information, but salt is electrical, and salt, when its, when its cubic bonds actually fall away when it becomes into water, then it shares that information with the water, and that water then becomes a liquid crystal because... Salt is a crystal, water is liquid, they come together, and they have this new type of information that is held within this liquid, and that's also what we are. I always think that actually our cellular memory is there because of the salt in our body mixed with the water, and really, I think that there is this idea for me anyway, that water outside of the body and within the body is an observer. And I think there's two types of water in water. And I see that within a lot of different avenues, like in the work that I do, and maybe we should kind of come back a little bit before I get really into that. Sure. Perhaps, yeah, I agree. Perhaps a starting point for those familiar with, with Dr. Emoto, uh, we can maybe talk about the difference in your work because you've done something very different mm. um, using some of the same principles. And for those that are unfamiliar, he was a scientist in Japan that essentially uh, photographed water in its frozen state and um, noticed that there was different influences on the shape and color of the crystals based on the influence. So he'd write love or hate on a flask and freeze it play heavy metal at one, play classical at another, and so on. Hidden messages in water. We'll put links to it in the show notes. And while I'm at it, uh, the show notes are going to be really important for this one, guys. It's lukestory.com slash VEDA, V-E-D-A, because we're going to pack that blog post for this episode with a bunch of photos of her work, uh, which are just (laughs) mind-blowing. And you're going to hear about them and be like, wait, I want to see this. So we're going to cover that. But yeah, perhaps you could um, just kind of talk about how you developed your technique and what it is uh, fundamentally, and then people can go look at it and freak out. Yeah, and do it for themselves, which is what I always encourage people to do. Um, So in the beginning, uh, so just to carry on, there was another person who really influenced me and really encouraged me to kind of move forward, and his name is Laurent Costa. And he's a French um, microscopic photographer that takes photos similar to a moto in the same kind of way with that, with flash freezing water and then photographing what is seen in the ice. But his, where he came from, his ethos was quite uh, unique in that he thought of water as his spiritual teacher. <clears throat> and so he didn't want to influence the water. He didn't want to project himself upon the water. He just wanted to invite water to share whatever it wanted. And what's so amazing about the photos, and which I can share with you, um, that he took, where he was getting smiley faces microscopically. He was getting perfect hearts. He was seeing fish. And often he would look into a dish and smile at the water prior to freezing it. And these, all these happy faces were appearing. And when you see them, they make you smile. And I worked professionally as an oil painter for, for quite some years. So I see the world through a very artistic lens. So rather than seeing the geometries that Emoto was photographing, which look a lot like snowflakes, he was, I was seeing like these amazing faces and stuff. And then there was a man called Thomas Hieronymus, who was a radionic engineer and he observed that when he, he went into a Parisian meat market 
and he noticed that the freshly placed organs of an animal appeared to be affecting the way the frost froze on the glass behind where they were placed. For example, like a liver, um, the, a liver would appear, the shape of a liver would appear in the frost um, above where the liver organ was, and so on and so on. And his idea was that there was still some kind of life force energy emanating out of these organs because there was water in the blood. And that water in the blood was communicating with the water outside of the barrier of the organ. That's insane. So and like kind of a coherence. A coherence right? and information it's, it's finding transfer. each other again, right? It's always finding each other. Wow. Water's always looking for water. That's why we search for each other. That's why we look for love. Wow. We're always attracted to certain people and we kind of remember them somehow. Some people feel so familiar to us. And I've always thought that we have this liquid within us, but we always forget that there's water in the air. And so because we have electrical charge, that gives off a certain, quite far, it goes quite far. And the water in the air is attracted to that electrical charge. And that actually is the way in which we can go into a room and just feel how it feels to us. The information is being transferred from the air into the fluid system. And that's how we feel what another person feels like. And there is a memory that is shared between those people. It's a feeling that we get. It's like, I just kind of know you from somewhere and no one really can explain how that is, except that it is. And most people have felt that. So as I, anyway, I digress. So as I was inspired by these people, I was really inspired by Thomas's work, or really his observation, because it was macroscopic. So I've been doing this work as a water researcher for nearly nine years. And back then I didn't have a microscope. And I was really curious, like, could water really store information? That was my, my question. Because you read all this stuff, but I, I always say, if you don't believe everything you read or everything you hear, like, see if you can do it yourself, if there's any way. And so I had some water, obviously had some good water. And I had a glass Petri dish from something else I was doing. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to put some water in this Petri dish. The secret seems to be in the freezing. I'm going to put it in my freezer and then I'm going to pull it out and photograph it. But I'm going to basically just think of something and project the thought into water. That was my very rude and rudimentary kind of thought. So I held my Petri dish of water in my hand and I noticed there was a bit of fluff floating around in it. So I was like, oh my God. So I put my hand in, take the fluff out. But my conscious thought was, I wonder if my hand will have any impact on the water's quote unquote memory because I didn't know if it was real or not. And then I put it in the freezer with the broccoli and the peas and the ice cream and stuff and <laughs> like just forgot about it and came back to it a few hours later and took it out of the freezer, held it up to the light and took a photo on my iPhone. And the photo really was remarkable and kind of freaked me out, if I'm honest, because there was this hand in the ice that was so undoubtedly a hand that I was taken aback. It took up half the Petri dish. So this is something I'm looking at with my naked eye. And I managed to capture it on my phone. And I was sort of almost in disbelief. So I showed it to my son, Rama. And I, he didn't know what I'd done. And I said, what does this look like to you? And he said, it's a hand, mom. It's kind of a creepy hand because it looked like an x-ray of a hand. I'm like, I know, but it is. It's a hand. Like, or maybe it's a coincidence. You know, I immediately went there. And so then I thought, well, if any water's going to be informed, it's got to be seawater. So I got some seawater because we live by the beach and froze a thin layer of that. And in the ice, there was this incredible outline of a fish and its tail and its fins and this perfectly round eye. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like what? And then my my freezer became my most used household appliance. And I, I did so many different um, co-creations, I like to call them, because I'm very much in the same camp actually as um, Laurent Costa. I, I really don't think of this work as experimentation because I'm a body of water that doesn't want to be experimented on and because I'm seeing water respond to me. And in my culture, my father's Maori, there's a great deal of respect of water being an intelligent um, kind of 
living source and I've an heard you, ancestor. I, I've heard you mention um, in relation to uh, peoples of antiquity and cultures that are still intact, however few there might be, that they always referred to water as the waters, hmm. right? It's, yeah. it, it's not just this minimized thing. It's this holy, sacred yeah. element. And I, when I heard you saying that, I was like, oh, that's so interesting. That's very true. It was pre-Roman times. And it's interesting because, yeah, people would talk about waters in a very reverent kind of way. And it's very sacred as the waters. It's like the body of waters. Capital T, capital W. Yes. Right? And like then the it, earth. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it stopped being called that when plumbing came into the world. And, and yeah. we started realizing, like, oh, oh, water's taking water. out a waste <laughs> away. It was just, right. it, now it's water. But then we started breaking it down even further into H2O. But wow. where the waters really still are around in our language is still with a sacred type of water where we say her waters broke. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's still some remnant of that right. sacredness there. You know, thinking about this, it's always been interesting. Well, I, don't, I guess not always, but as soon as I figured it out, but I, I've been a fan of hot springs since I was a little kid. I lived sometimes yeah. in Colorado and I would say soaking in hot springs and just natural bodies of water in general, whether they be freezing in the winter or hot, um, is probably my very favorite thing to do. Mm. Literally, like if you're like, what's your number one thing in the world to do, you know, as far as like an activity, I think it would be that. And I've observed how where these hot springs are located around the world, and I've been to many all over the place, um, they were sacred centers of the peoples that were there before that land was colonized and sort of settled by the people that came in and took that land from said native peoples. Um, but there's always this great um, historical account or reverence for those waters, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you go to some little hot springs resort in a small mountain town somewhere and you kind of look into the history of it, it's, it's very um, common that there was a prehistory to it, which involved the native peoples, right? And then someone came in and acquired that land and then turned it into a little, you know, monetized it into a little hot spring mm -hmm. center or something mm -hmm. like a spa, right? But it's interesting to observe how humans have always settled around springs, not only hot springs, but drinking springs to the point that so many towns, at least in this country, are called something springs, yeah. right? Even like in downtown LA, there's a street called Spring Street. And I was told, I'd, I haven't researched this to find if it was true, but it makes sense that there is actually a buried spring under Spring Street and that when people uh, flocked to what became Los Angeles, that city was really built upon that spring as the central hub of a source of free and abundant water. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like we we kind of know as we develop civilizations that you got to be where the water's coming out of the ground. Yeah. And that that's where we've flourished to the point that all of those townships and and etc around water have become our cities mm -hmm. right i mean at least many of them it's so interesting yeah well in some indigenous cultures it's interesting because <laughs> a lot of native people and the ancients really they wanted they thought of this earth really truly as a living being and they wanted to understand and be able to know where to nurture her and so it was a very interesting thing because they thought of the springs, the, 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 the colder springs, um, more as arteries, but the hot springs were more like organs. Oh, and wow. So within the organs, the, the sitting and the, and the healing aspect of sitting and healing within the hot springs was actually part of you being able to exchange your energy to help heal the water heal the organ of the planet. These little organs that are around, they're all very sacred. And because they were considered to be sacred, when you go into these, these hot organs, should we say, there is this kind of um, information transfer that happens from you. So if you go in there with the intention to heal, so, so much of today's world, we are looking for ways to heal. We're all looking for ways to heal, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever that is. But very rarely do we go into it with the idea that we want to heal the planet, that what we want to do is give back. But back then... I totally feel like a jerk. I've never gone into a hot spring. <laughs> I'm always just like, oh, I'm going in, this water's going to hook me up. You know, I'm never like thinking... I mean, I have a reverence and a respect for it, but I've never had the thought like, 
I'm going to, you know, assist in healing an, an element of the planet through my intention and mm-hmm. and my will. That's very interesting. Yeah. And and I think that that's one of the things I always suggest to people. One of the things I always say, because you have no idea how many people ask me, like, what's the best water to drink? You know, what kind of filtration system is this and this? And we can get into some of that. But what we forget, we always forget, is that we are this incredibly sophisticated system of water. And when you said about what was our, what if we were our skin was invisible, this is what I ask children when I go and teach in schools. I do projects with 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 about I think they're like between eight and eleven or twelve year olds, and I just donate time. And we do this cross between a water science project and an art project. And I teach them how to do my crystallography. But I always say, if your skin was invisible and your organs were see-through, what would you look like? And always they end up coming back to waterfalls and tributaries and these kinds of things. It comes back to water and water systems. But one boy, he said, I'd look like a brain-shaped cloud with electrical rain falling down and moving through my body in the shape of a person. I'm like, oh my God, (laughs) it was next level. Wow. But these young people are coming in with all this information to teach us and remind us. And it's Mm. so nice to give them a, a platform where they get to actually see how to do this work and how to form a relationship with this the the blood of this planet so really when you're sitting in a hot spring or you're sitting in any spring you're sitting in the blood of the planet we never think about this we tend to always think about how this is going to feel good for me and this is going to heal me because we are in this container which of course makes us very relevant it's all everything is relative to the eye yeah self self self-referential yeah yeah um, in in New Zealand, which is somewhere I've always wanted to go, solely because I mean, obviously it looks beautiful in photos, but from what I hear, there's a lot of hot spring activity there. Is that true? There is Rotorua, um, and and there are various different hot springs around. And it's interesting. Um, I'll share something with you. I don't think I've ever shared with anyone actually. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I think it was on my last, the last time I went to hospital for surgery and I was in so much pain before the ambulance came and I, I, I was in some kind of altered state. Sometimes pain can take you to a place you didn't expect would ever take you. And I, and I remember lying in bed, like really, I thought I was going to be a come unconscious because the pain was so bad. And I remember being in the suddenly in the space, which was sort of in between an awake and almost sleep or unconscious space. And I had this memory and this this vision, really, um, where I was a, a young boy. I was around about thirteen, and I was uh, my my grandmother and my grandfather were sitting on either side of me, and they were, had full tamako, which is the Maori tattoos on their faces and I was in pain as a this boy and this little boy and they were trying to cool me down and trying to help me they were very nurturing but they called me a name they called me a name called pikirangi which means to climb up to the sky and I knew where I was in that vision I was in this place called Rotorua and Whenever I have needed to heal, I have driven to this this place, which is this thermal um, wonderland, where there are these geysers and mud pools, and it's all very thermal. And it smells like rotten eggs, and right, it's, right. <laughs> and it's amazing. But I remember um, researching about that years later, and there is a marae, which is uh, a a place where the Maori tribe will come to congregate, congregate, and uh, there was one in reference to a chief who was called Pikirangi. And I didn't have any clue about any of that, but I remember being in that space and I'd always been drawn to go to heal in Rotorua. And so there's, you can get the mud there and a lot of people love to put the mud all over their bodies and even the the minerals in the mud and the heat. It's very, very good for you, great for your skin and makes you feel 
feel good. I love doing that. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah. When, hot, when hot springs, I mean, rocky hot springs are cool, you know, but when they're muddy, I love that. I just cover myself in mud and go lay in the sun. If yeah. there's sun, it's the best ever. But even when you watch the geysers, when they, they kind of start to erupt, um, there is a time frame in that. So it's kind of like this, even the geysers, the, the, these organs, they kind of have their own heartbeat, their own timing. And um, we were just in Pagosa Springs. Oh, love we, it. We were there for a couple of nights. So good. And I couldn't sleep it. And I was awakened at five in the morning. I went into the pools. And one of the pools had like that I was in, it had like this kind of time frame where this bubbling up would start to come up. And I was timing it actually because weirdly i'm just really into like timing stuff when it comes to water and i noticed that it would come up every 120 seconds it would start to bubble up and kind of like look like it was going to erupt and then it would go down and it was we were just in this very i, I it was just me and with the water i'm saying we me and the water yeah. were in this space together and eventually some people that came came in the pool at like six in the morning and I well, noticed that the water just, it, it stopped doing it regularly. It, it, it became more every three minutes rather than every 120, I mean, every three minutes rather than 120 seconds. And so it was really interesting that it actually changed when people came in the pool. And then when the people left, it went back to 120 seconds. Really? So it was reacting to their energy. Wow. And it was so interesting to me because it was a very sacred, special time when you get up really early in the morning and you bathe in the water and you're in that space. It's a sacred, holy space. And there is just you and all of this, this fluid of life. And there is communication that happens. It's such an intimate thing. Even down to the last, I always say to people, what was the last word you spoke before you drink water? Because I've done tests where I've frozen the saliva after saying a word. And there is evidence to say that even your saliva can um, share information about that word. So it suggests that whatever you're saying, the saliva is holding that information and that is the first contact outside of your consciousness that physical water is going to come into your physical body and actually interact with the first word, which is still vibrating in your mouth when you speak. And so rather than it being all about what this water can do for you, I think, okay, what can this body of water, how inviting do I want me to be? How inviting do I want this temple of water to be for this water that is entering me it is literally such an intimate exchange it's one of the reasons the ancients and many people today pray or say a blessing or be grateful before they eat or drink because there is a resonance within your mouth that is an invitation for the food and the water that is coming into you becoming part of you wow now it's time to turn you on to one of my favorite deliciously calming nighttime elixirs. It's called Organifi Gold. If you've ever had a golden latte, you know what I'm talking about, but you probably spent $10 on it if you had one. Well, now you can make one at home in about five seconds. And even though it tastes like a dessert drink, this is low sugar and totally guilt-free. My recipe for Organifi Gold is usually some hot spring water, a little grass-fed butter or ghee, or maybe even coconut oil and a giant scoop of gold powder. Then I toss that in the blender and I'm good to go for a super chilled out night and great sleep. The gold mix is loaded with organic, non-GMO superfoods and herbs like turmeric, ginger, reishi mushroom, lemon balm, and turkey tail mushroom. The only real issue I've had with the Organifi Gold is that I go through it so quickly that I can hardly keep my supply intact. So if anyone Organifi is listening, hook a brother up. But seriously, this stuff really does taste amazing and also satisfies my late night sweet tooth while chilling me out after a long day of podcasting. So to get your claws into some of this Organifi gold, just visit Organifi.com slash lifestylist. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I, Organifi with an I, Organifi.com slash lifestylist. And if you use the code lifestylist, they're going to hook you up with 20% off. 
They have an incredible suite of products there, so make sure to cruise the site a bit and use that 20% off lifestylist code at checkout. That's cool you were in Pagosa Springs. That's one of my favorite springs ever because they have all the different temperatures too, Yeah, you know? And then the river right there. I've always wanted to go in the winter when the river's freezing. Yeah. I've only been oh, in the summer. Oh, it was pretty cold. Was really? it? Was yeah. it? I mean, it's still nice and refreshing in the <laughs> yeah. summer. Kids are swimming out there and stuff. But I remember I was there and I was like, oh man, I got to come here in the winter and get the full deep freeze. Yeah. But uh, wow, that's so fascinating that the time, I, I never thought about like the pulsing of the geysers and the timing. You know, in some water, there's a spring uh, outside of Santa Fe called, I think it's called Ojo, Ojo Caliente, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they have like a carbonated spring, a natural spring that's oh, carbonated. Wow. You know, it's like hot Pellegrino water <laughs> and it's very buoyant, you know, and it's really easy to float around in there. It's, it's just fantastic the way that the, um, you know, the planet actually interacts with that water. And I love your perspective of what can we contribute to that interaction. That's really beautiful. Uh, yeah. And, and so what I'm seeing with my work as an interaction, I call it like a co-creation. Because like I mentioned earlier, it's, it, I think that water is actually communicating rather than conforming to our conscious expression. And, and I say that because I see it time after time after time after time again, and that water doesn't always do what you think it's going to do. It seems to be almost sovereign in the way in which it communicates with you and with me. And so an example of that is that I um, was doing mul like multiple studies of the sound of OM. And water seems to love to design a specific pattern for that sound. And it's, it looks a lot like uh, the rings of a tree. It's kind of like lots of circles all in like that. And so in my arrogance, I thought, oh, well, if I play the sound of a gong, it kind of sounds a little bit like that. Um, I'm sure water will probably do something similar. And, and I had an assumption that I knew what water would do. And that's never a good idea in this work that I do to kind of know, think you know, because I've found that water A won't work, it won't, it won't design, or B, it will do something completely different. And what it did for the sound of a gong was create the gong with the mallet on top. It actually designed the, the instrument. Oh, my God. <laughs> instead of doing like a sound pattern. Oh, my God. Like in cymatics. Right, yeah. So it was very interesting. I'm very mindful these days of to stay in a place of curiosity, to step out of my ego space, and simply invite, not allow, because that suggests I have dominance over something, but invite water to share whatever it wants to with me. And because I was observant that water really likes to design an art, and I always say that art is the heart of water, um, I, I started using photos of people to see if it would show their faces or their features, a kind of facial recognition. And so one of my most well-known images is of my friend Wendy. And so I basically put her photograph um, on, on the table, put my Petri dish of water on top of it, froze it using my technique, which I'd like to talk about, um, and then uh, photographed it. And you clearly saw her face in the ice. And so then I've used other people's faces and we see their features. And if they're on a profile, it will usually show a profile. If it's face on, you'll usually see the face on. It's, I, I even have used statues like the statue of Jupiter or, or Zeus, how, whichever, wherever you come from, you like to call it whichever, but with the big beard. And although I had frozen it just a bit too long, you can see all the features of the beard and the hair and the face, eyes, nose, everything. And my friend and my mentor, Dr. Gerald Pollack, he's been kind of guiding me along this journey for quite some years now. And he said, well, you know, what would be very helpful would be if you uh, put together a survey of 20 or 25 of your photos and really just ask people what they thought this image looked like. So I did that and I got friends to distribute it around social media. So no one knew what they were looking at. No one knew if, what the medium was and no one knew it came from me. And the question under each picture was, what does this image look like to you? And 
297 people did the survey and 85% of people were able to identify the images compared to like what the influence was prior. Um, and out of all of them, there were three images where 100% of, pe of people could recognize them. And you have to realize this is liquid water going in to the freezer and ice coming out with imagery that you can see with your naked eye. And I always say to people, if this is way too out there for you to accept or to comprehend or you think it's just absolute bollocks, and there's always people <laughs> that find that just too difficult to uh, like get their head around because it really isn't a thing you're supposed to get your head around. It's just something you're supposed to feel. And I always say, well, look at it as art because I like to come from the threefold of science, art, and consciousness because I think there is a beautiful interweave that can happen. And if you think and you look at this imagery as art and realize this is the most organically made art you can imagine, it takes it on from a, a, a different perspective. You're not trying to pick it apart and go, oh, she must have been doing this or this or this or that or the other. You're like, you can ask the question, what does this, this mean to me? And that's much more of what I want for people to appreciate. It's like, what does that image mean to me? Because water, I think, can be the voice piece for nature. Water is in every single living thing on this planet. And the fact that now we can take something which is essentially not seen, which is in the liquid form, and then it comes into this seen place, it's really, really remarkable. And even um, Rudolf Steiner recommends to his students, well, used to recommend before he passed, to uh, look at the frost, look how the frost freezes on a butcher's window compared to that of a florist's. And I mean, one of my heroes, Victor Schauberger, you know, has, he's done so many things and given so much about implosion and explosion and all the different things that he's observed with water. But it's his relationship with water that always got me so, um, just so excited because I can relate to it so well. He said that he would sit and watch a stream and there was a point where he became unconscious. And when he became conscious again, what he realized and what he observed was that, and what he said was that his free consciousness, he always called it free consciousness, was taken away by the current of the water and then returned to him after some time, full of information about the water. Water was able to share the temperatures it liked, the kind of way in which it liked to move, all its information about its intimate journey. And I'm pretty sure it also shared information to him around how he started to understand anti-gravity devices and things like that. Because, you know, he actually said, I, I, I was a... a, a um, a searcher, but then I became a researcher using my free consciousness and setting it out on these expeditions with water, and it came back with all this information for me. And he considered, much like many indigenous people, that water essentially was a, a living being. And so as I have started to realize that, firstly, 30, however many thousand photos I've taken shows that this isn't random or coincidental. And with the amount of repeated studies that I've done, I'm seeing images that you can recognize that are showing up over and over again. And so it always it lends you down this road of like, well, what does this mean then? Like, what is, what is this? What are you even working with here? Like, what really is water? Given that it's in so many different states, and for the, I'm sure most of your viewers would know that there is a, a fourth phase of water, the liquid, solid, gas, and then the type of plasma or gel, which is a more viscous type of water that has a negative charge that can absorb more light, um, slightly uh, uh, more alkaline. And that's the kind of water in our cells. But you can also find that that water is outside of the body in certain waters. and. So the secrets are always in the subtleties of everything. 
and nature hides her secrets well. And so I've always found when thinking about these different realms, these different stages of water, how many subtleties there must be. Because even as water begins to freeze, it freezes in layers. And it's almost like each layer is is informed in its in its own way, and so there is these subtleties in each layer of ice as it begins to freeze. So I used to completely freeze water, and I still got incredible imagery. But I look back now, all those nearly nine years ago, and I'm like, that's amazing that I got such incredible imagery and totally frozen water because I haven't done that in years. When I started to really look into the new science of water, and there really is one, I started to recognize that there were these different stages and maybe I was missing something important. So I started to open my freezer earlier and earlier and earlier to see what stage the water was in its freezing. And I came to realize that Water really, around about 4 minutes, 45 seconds to 5 minutes, does something really amazing. And it's different with each person's person's freezer setting. But um, it kind of goes into these two phases, which I call informed and uninformed. But essentially they are a liquid crystal and um, or basically liquid and uh, a kind of ice. I say it's kind of kind of ice. Um, because it's so early on in its stage of freezing that it would I would consider it to be fourth phase water. It's kind of in the stage between molecular chaos and molecular order. I call it the space of creation, where water uses its building blocks of ice to design, kind of like pixels do for a photo. And so in this space, it's just kind of a different type of ice. And there is liquid on top of that. And so when we were children, at least for me, um, I'd be given a piece of paper and a glue stick and said, like, just draw something with the glue stick and then sprinkle the glitter on top and shake it away. Well, essentially, your conscious expression is the glue and the water that is most attracted to that conscious expression is that first freeze. And the liquid water is the liquid, is kind of akin to that glitter that you tip away. And so there's two types of water theme has gone throughout my work over all these years. Um, And that is that even with egg albumin, because I've always been so curious about what would be the most informed kind of water. And I always thought it it had to be amniotic fluid. But since that's not readily available, um, I thought, well, the next best thing would be to study eggs an egg albumin, the egg white. And I noticed there's two types of kind of water in egg white. There's a kind of gloopy, gelatinous part, which is more of the protein for the bird. And then there's a part which is more akin to saliva. And when you freeze that, something really interesting happens in that there is, if it's a free-range, happy, healthy hen, um, then it would have laid an egg which has six patterns that I've identified. And really universally? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. And so and I know I I I have done a lot with caged hen eggs in comparison. And they struggle to form even one pattern. And that's very, very interesting because across the board I've I, I have done hundreds of studies on caged eggs, kind of compared to free range happy hens or ducks or or quails or um, geese and across for for birds there are these six patterns that I've identified but any any animal or any bird that's been caged and not um, free to roam uh, seems to struggle the eggs seem to struggle to form these patterns and I did a test just the other day so this is really really fun because I'm sharing something that I've really just discovered and that when you put a free-range happy egg um, beside a caged hen egg, um, of which never before have I ever seen more than one pattern in, and leave them together overnight side by side, the information from the happy hen egg is transferred to the really poor quality egg, and 
th- that that starts to form more crystallography. What? And I'm like, wow. So oh someone said to me, well, yeah, okay, but that's just one on one. What if? What if? Because people, adults, will always compare it to people, of course, and where that kind of suggests that someone who is happy, healthy, and well rounded is going to have a positive influence on a person if you put it into people terms so what i did was get one of those amazing eggs and surrounded it by caged in eggs and I left them overnight and what was and but what i did do was take one of those caged eggs and put it aside and did the crystallography of that and so what I observed, and I've shared it um, on social media, is that the eggs that were the, in the closest proximity to the good egg um, all had beautiful structures. And as they started to um, wait, go out slightly, they still changed. They still had more patterns, but they weren't quite as amazing as the ones that were sitting right next to it. But they all, all changed. And so... This is a very interesting phenomena because I've seen something similar happen in tap water when sitting next to spring water. But tap water has a very specific look crystallographically. It kind of is jagged and doesn't really have a lot of formal structure. Say so spring water will form these things that I call fern hexagons. It's like a hexagonal kind of star shape with ferns on each line. I call them these fern hexagons. And they also form fern shapes and uh, what I call like flowers. So spring water has a very specific look. And tap water tends to be lots of lines that are disordered. And so knowing that going into the study, I put one glass of tap water beside one glass of beautiful spring water, which I knew the how the patterns of, and left them overnight. And the information from the spring water was transferred into the tap water and you saw that the tap water started to form hexagons. It started to form like um, ferns. And even because that was that water I was drinking to help heal my body, um, the alkalinity of the tap water increased. What? Yes. Oh And my so God. that's then in alignment with Luke Montanua's work who really was talking about DNA tr- teleportation, where there was uh, a vial of, of pure water and another vial of pure water, and one had a sequence of DNA in it. They were put side by side and left overnight in radiant light. And the next day, they basically, I think the process was they added some kind of powder to see whether it could identify there was any DNA present. And that they did that to the water. They had nothing in it except it was sitting next to one that did. And that they found there was a DNA sequence actually identified in that water. There was a transfer. And that apparently has been repeated. So I know that's fringe. And that like to me even that seems like such a big deal because that then says, well, what What's going on if we're just stand, standing next to somebody? What if we're sleeping next to somebody? How much information is being <laughs> transferred here? Like, what's going on? Many people listening right now are thinking about people they didn't know that well they, <laughs> they had sex with. <laughs> That's the first thing that went to my mind. I was yeah. like, thank God I'm married. <laughs> <clears throat> I know who I'm sleeping next to. You know, I, I, it's, I, I mean, it's interesting. I've done studies on lots of bodily fluids because... I mean, urine is a very um, easily accessible one. But in my earlier stages of doing this, I had access to semen from men that were had had vasectomies and men that hadn't. And when you freeze that, you, I observed something really, really interesting because our bodily fluids through crystallography can share so much information. Um, across the board, the men that had live sperm they there would be these bubbles, they were solid, and they just formed these very bright, light, kind of silver-like looking bubbles. Whereas the men that had had vasectomies, there would be a bubble that was clearly starting to form, but they had been, it was almost as if the tops had been chopped off. They were like a bubble with a flat surface on the top. And it was very interesting, very clear distinction very different. But even in um, to test for 
uh, if a woman is ovulating, there is the saliva prediction kit that has been around for many, many years, where basically a woman just spits on a glass dish and takes a magnifying glass that lets it dry. And if she's fertile, there will be these ferns that have started to form in the saliva. And if she's not fertile, they won't be there. And so our body is so much information that it can share with us. And I've even tracked my urine, I've tracked my cycle. And so I've done two months worth of testing urine every day and seen that in the beginning stages, there is a specific pattern that appears coming up to being fertile. There is a very specific kind of um, pattern that looks very similar to the hydroglyph for electrical charge. Wow. And then as you're as you go into kind of beginning your period again, you'll start to see this kind of other pattern. And so even urine can tell us information about ourselves. And I love tears. People always ask, have you used tears? And so I have, I have done a few tests with tears. Uh, one of them that comes to mind, and there's usually always a Petri dish of water on my bench top um, in the kitchen. And so I I was cutting onions and I'm like, oh, here's an opportunity. So I like got the Petri dish <laughs> and I put some, some harvesting, yeah, the, harvesting yeah, the tears and it, they went into the water. So it was mixed with water and I froze it and I got this image, which I've shared kind of fairly widely. Um, of that looked like my iris, the iris of an eye. And when it comes to tears, people often ask me about water and its relationship with emotions. And I think that water really is fluid emotion that we can see. And that is within us. And our tears, especially specifically, I'll say, uh, the tears that come up when we are deeply in pain, when we're really really um, sad and uh, and emotional and our faces are designed in such a way where the tears will come from our eyes and come around our face towards our mouth because those tears have been structured perfectly to actually help ease our pain they're meant to be taken back into the mouth and be a medicine for us we we keep forgetting just how incredible oh we are designed. Someone once said to me, well, you know, what if water is expressing its consciousness through every living thing on this planet to observe itself from every single perspective and not just from this planet, perhaps from many. And it's interesting because people often also ask me, is water masculine or feminine? Because we often refer, refer to water as being feminine. But I always think of water as being in balance. So even if you do want to look, become kind of uh, one of the people that look at water as H2O, well, actually, the two hydrogens are feminine, and the masculine is the oxygen. Feminine um, hydrogen is, is kind of the element of, of levity, and oxygen is the element of gravity. And so together they work perfectly to allow there to even be water on this earth. There is a harmony, a, a beautiful kind of intimate relationship between oxygen and hydrogen. And so it's so, um, so interesting kind of looking at it from these different perspectives, given that by molecular count we're 99% water and that actually science is very split whether water comes from seeded the planet from meteorites and asteroids, or whether water comes from within this uh, the Earth's mantle held within the ringwoodite um, of the Earth, within the Earth, there's said to be actually more, just as much, if not more, water inside the Earth's mantle as there is said to be actually on the surface of Earth. It's called primary water, and it will come up through cracks and fishes um and come up like a spring and it's kind of made uh, inside um, the earth. i want to interject there mm -hmm. uh in a recent solo cast i did a whole thing on uh primary water and this to me it's like it's just, there's so many things you're talking about that i didn't even know that are fascinating but i've always had the sense as being a spring water collector for god i think i started when i was a little kid with my grandmother 
because these springs, you know, like high Rocky Mountain springs and such, um, they're so they're eight, ten thousand feet up, and there's this levity to the water. It's it's just being drawn to the surface, and it just goes and goes for hundreds of years that have been recorded, right? Back to people settling around these springs. And I always thought that was so interesting. And then when you have water like that tested, it's completely pure and free of any industrial contamination whatsoever. You know, the acid rain, the nuclear testing, whatever, chemtrails, it's just pure, clean water. Um, And I've always thought that was really interesting. So I, you know, being a, a... novice researcher um, compared to you found this thing primary water Mm -hmm. and that in and of itself i highly encourage people to research because it it does many things but one is that it totally um dispels what i believe to be a myth that there's a a finite amount of drinking water Mm -hmm. here like Mm -hmm. potable water i think they call it right that the the earth actually manufactures water Mm -hmm. you know i mean this is just mind-blowing right because Mm -hmm. I think we've been led to believe that there's this scarcity, like with crude oil and things like that, that there's only so much of it. And so by that scarcity being created, of course, now there's a sort of an artificial value attributed to that, like gold or diamonds or Mm -hmm. something like that, right? If diamonds were, if every grain of sand on the beach was a diamond, it'd be worthless, right? But you have to go get it and there's only so much of it, right? (laughs) So I just find the primary water thing interesting. And just from a health perspective, just... The water that I would prefer to drink if I had my uh, my choice was water that's never been on the surface of the planet mm-hmm. before versus water that's you know been through that hydrological cycle of precipitation, rain, snow, lands on the mountain, becomes a stream, then becomes a river, eventually ends up back in the ocean and goes back up kind of in this, so they say at least, this cyclical kind of um, uh, pattern, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, so that primary water thing to me is just like, that's next level. Well... I think one of the things that we need to become mindful of, and if nothing else, this idea of scarcity of water can hopefully make people realize how to treat it, how valuable it really is, not as a resource, but as source. And I think that, well, the idea that there is so much water, and that's not an idea. There is so much water. But I think, if nothing else, we need to learn how to start to treat water. Because so many huge companies go out and just buy up massive amounts of it, lots and all the springs. There's so many people even coming to New Zealand and, you know, taking so much of our water and you know, exporting it, bottling it, exporting it. I mean, we really have made something that should be free for all humanity into this monetary kind of um, commodity. And it's what, what sometimes I don't think we realize, and it's probably maybe sometimes just me that thinks this, but when you give, really, really get that we're bodies of water, we're selling ourselves. We literally are selling ourselves when we sell water. Because that has gone through the clouds, the trees, the animals, you know, the, the inside of the earth. It's gone through our ancestors. And if, if nothing else, as a humanitarian right, I think all people should be allowed and, and, and have to have water available to them for free. I think that it's, we, we have commoditized so much stuff. And we've also polluted so much stuff. But we have the ability to come into reverence. And I think, you know, I'm sure you know of, there's a, um, a website called Find a Spring where you can go and actually yeah. click to your own water. That's my friend Chris, yeah, his site, right. who, who does the Alive Waters. Yeah. yeah. And it's I mean, the best. It, it's, he's offering the opportunity of pilgrimage to people to go and have a connection, a relationship with their water source because when we go to a store and we go to pick out like what you know whatever water there is and we're drinking it we're not usually thinking about the fact that it came from some beautiful spring somewhere we don't tend to make that uh, kind of assessment 
any more than we make an assessment of where our where meat comes from. We don't think of the animal when we're eating the meat. It's just meat and it's just water. You know, we we tend to like not think about these things. And that's why I think when you get in touch and go and collect the water yourself, and if you eat meat, if you can like have a relationship with your food and you do that yourself, if you can do that yourself and actually go through that process and give some respect to that animal that that you've, you know, killed and am going to are going to eat, then you know, I think that you would see the world slightly differently. But if we're so used to everything being packaged up for us that we tend to lose the relationship. And so that I mean I tend to see the world from that perspective as that convenience is one of those things that we're we're very fortunate to have in the West. And I spent a lot of time in India. And it actually, you know, I, I've observed many things, uh, having spent time um, in in places a lot of people wouldn't go to in India. And I noticed something actually very interesting where there were some um, ladies that were at a, a, a pump, a water pump, and they were helping each other hold a, their sari um, um, under the tap. And they were coming from quite a poor area. And usually, though, if you, when you get married, you will often have silk saris. And so they uh, were using um, a marital sari. And the, the person was translating to me and said, yeah, they filter the water through silk because they know that that is going to help the water be cleaner for them, but also it helps them evolve in a spiritual way. And I thought that was so interesting. And then I started diving into um, where Rudolf Steiner recommends exactly the same thing. The, really? The, how filtering through silk makes this huge structural change. What? And an emotional, like, not a, I say emotional because I think water has an emotional state of health or energetic state of health. But also uh, that my partner and I, we're working on actually putting together something which is going to be so incredibly beautiful using silk filters. And so even Jerry Pollack, who I had a conversation with not a few weeks ago, um, said that that even sitting silk so just sitting beside water helps it's the water starts to build EC. And so when you think about silk, how it's prepared, how it's created, then you see that there is this little creature that is actually creating a cocoon to evolve, to transform. And that transformation process is very relative. And so even in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere in India, these these ladies are doing this process, and they have had different information from different the same information, different source, and so there are different, there are many different things to look at when it comes to how we can interact with water. But water doesn't like going through these right angles through piping. It doesn't it doesn't enjoy that. It loves to flow in vortex. And so uh, I have a lot of compassion for tap water, you know, because it's gone through so, so much, so many stresses. And I did a study where I, I because I, it has such a specific look, tap water, that um, I wanted to see what would happen to it if um, you, when you put it through a uh, vortex or you put it into a singing bowl, maybe played the bowl and then froze it and see if it changes anything. And so when you used um, restructuring devices, uh, you noticed that there was a change in crystallography. But even more than that, even more than using these uh, ways of restructuring, your conscious expression, just holding a bottle of tap water to your heart for enough time that it gets to hear that heartbeat your your you were kind of when you're seated your natural calm heartbeat it can transform it into water that can look like spring water 
Really? Yes. Man, you, you could have saved me a lot of money. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love I love these water structuring devices. I have one, a little handheld one by Natural Action. That's really cool. Oh, we, some, we have that too. Yeah. And then there's one, you get one for the pool, your swimming mm-hmm. pool. And then I got one for the whole house water. Then this bottle right here too, I wanted to show you um, by Leela Quantum Tech. Mm-hmm. This is, they make these technology, that little cube over there. They make these, mm-hmm. um, you know... Whenever you use the word quantum, I'm always like, ah, oh, it sounds so fake. But they've done a number of studies actually with the Emoto Institute. Um, this is a quantum energy infused water bottle that structures it. And then these guys, Soma Vedic, have also done some testing mm-hmm. with Emoto where they show that the influence of their technology on the water. But that's super funny. You're like, <laughs> you can just hold a glass of water up to your heart and just feel good. And you str- and so you found that that, that that human, no technology method had a not only discernible, but perhaps even more identifiable effect on structuring water? It does when you have a relationship with water. Ah, okay. So not just any person that's like, oh yeah, I'm going to hold it up here and think happy thoughts. It can make a difference even doing that. I mean, there's many studies done not only on water, uh, but on people, where you can show someone a lot of attention and love and you can show someone a lot of the exact opposite and yell and scream and tell them that they're terrible and all this kind of stuff and there are different effects on that person but the the child specifically that is ignored or the within Emoto's work you know the rice experiments the one that's ignored is actually becomes the worst it shows the worst structures and so even if you are taking tap water and just, you know, going, oh, I'm just going to hold it and think something nice. And then at least you're showing some attention. You're giving it some something. I'm not saying it doesn't change it chemically. But like I said, there is a kind of an emotional state of health. And I, and I put that into a kind of like, I think of tap water similar to someone who's very sick. And that you still have a choice of being happy or sad, even though you might be medically sick. And so what I've seen is that because tap water can energetically, structurally change, although it's chemically not changing, it's similar to a doctor might say, you're still sick even if you're happy. But if someone comes to you and gives you a hug and makes you feel good, then any change is a positive change. If there's a positive change within the water, although there's not a chemical change. If you keep doing that, I'm pretty sure every single day, that is going to help your body heal because of the, the everyday input of positive positivity and feeling some kind of joy, feeling something positive is, is I think is going to make a much bigger change than you might even imagine. We're always kind of taught that we need something outside of ourselves to heal. But we have all of the tools really within this incredibly sophisticated fluid body, which I think, you know, I think we kind of live in two worlds, the world we live on and the world we live in. Everything that we ever experience in this world is felt through this body. We see the world with these eyes that take in the information. We hear the world. We hear the words. We hear music through our ears. We touch with the sensations through the body. We taste within the body. Everything is felt within the system. Is there ever anything we actually experience outside of this body? And it's interesting because we can observe ourselves. So there is something. Yeah, how how yeah. can we observe ourselves? Yeah. And so when I think of the water, which, which is in this physical body, I started to talk about two types of water. Well, I think there's two types of water in people. I think that there is the water that we drink that hydrates us and that you know goes throughout the system and gives us our energy and all these different processes um, that also passes through the body. But I think that there is a drop of consciousness within this body. And there's often throughout different um, philosophical texts and religious texts and you know various old ancient wisdoms that talk about a drop of consciousness that is within the body, that animates the body. Because there is something in the body. If somebody dies of natural causes, the brain and the organs, they're all still there, but nothing's working. 
There is the energy isn't there to make everything work. And so there is something missing. And I think when you start thinking of this kind of idea that perhaps there is two types of water in the body, that there is this this essence of water that holds us, our information, our, our real true nature. And because we're able to observe ourselves, whenever I observe myself, I always feel like I'm about here, like looking in. And because I think electrical charge has a has a and light have such a big play, such a big role in water and consciousness, and I want to talk about light. Um, but I think that the this fluid body, um, that that essence water is attracted to the water that is in the air. So we have that electrical charge that I was talking about. And I think that essence water or the subtle body or the spirit or the soul or whatever terms we might use it is able to move in and out on this kind of energetic um, kind of electrical uh, highway. And when we want to observe ourselves, it has the ability to come out and come back in again. And I think also with um, dreaming, like we can dream. Often I've dreamt and I've seen myself walking around in my dreams. And I've done a really interesting study because people say, oh, well, your consciousness is affecting the water. It can't possibly be sovereign, which is fair enough. Being a, having, Imagining that water might be sovereign and have a voice seems pretty crazy to a lot of people. Most people are getting around their head around the idea that water can store information. but. I've done a very lengthy study on dreams where I'll put a petri dish of water beside my bed with the intention that it captures some part of my dream and in the morning I'll freeze it and see if it'll share any imagery relative to my dream and fortunately I remember most of my dreams. And so for each time I did that, it was really, I mean, I still get so surprised because I tend to stay in a place of curiosity, try to stay out of my own way with this work. And I would, I, for example, I had a dream that I was in a sailboat and it was like these massive waves and I was feeling so seasick and it was just going on forever until we finally got to shore. And then when I froze the water, there was a sailboat in the image with these giant waves. And so it's interesting because when I'm asleep, I'm not the conscious observer of the water. I'm in a subconscious or even unconscious space. So it's as if the water was accompanying me as an observer. Now, when I've interviewed people, <laughs> when I've interviewed, this is bananas. It's cra- it's crazy and it's real. Like some, it's wow. like, wow. you know, sometimes these things seem so amazing. There's so many things that I don't share on social media because I'm like, no one is going to believe this. It's like it's so amazing. That that how can how can anyone even believe this? So I share the stuff that that you know people are, are able to see that they could probably get their head around. But um, but you know I've interviewed a lot of people that have had near death experiences, and because I think of this observer aspect um, with water, that uh, I three of those people that have. Uh, you know, technically died and come back alive again, said that they felt themselves rising and they looked down at their body whilst it was being resuscitated and they all said, oh, I hope that person's going to be okay. They had no attachment anymore to the physical body. They had just simply become an observer of what was going on. And if, and and because they were able to come back to the body and it was interesting, um, because I've I've read that if there's still some kind of brain function going on even when the heart stopped beating for a certain amount of time. And even in Jerry Pollock in one of his interviews that we were listening to actually today, where he was talking about some some study, someone had done a study on rats that um, after they had been killed, there was still water with the water in the butt the uh, was able to still flow through the body. There was still some for about a, um, an hour, which was a very interesting observation. And so, I think there is still that the kind of an, some kind of an electrical charge coming off when there is still 
some still life force energy, you know, like uh, that Thomas Romanus uh, observed there was something happening with that energy transfer from the organs to the frost. And so they were all able to observe themselves. They said they felt themselves rising. Now, when a gas rises and it, it, when it expands, it cools, which is then in alignment with people who say that they feel spirit as cold. And so it also kind of goes into, well, we're always told that spirit leaves the body, but never told how it does it. In my you know, observations, not saying that I know that this is a truth, but I hope one day this technology will be able to actually show something. I mean, we I have an idea that there's a vapor or some kind of the spirit looks somewhat like that. But I think because we know so little about the stages of water and the subtleties within them, that perhaps this this kind of second water, this this like essence water within us goes from maybe a fluid into some kind of vibrational vapor that vibrates at a, a, a faster level so that we, we just simply can't see it. And in that, it's basically becoming a gas, in which case it's taking information and it kind of taking it in into a, another stage. And when I, I touched on hydroglyphs, um, which is the, the kind of language, this visible language of water, uh, well, a, a man asked me, uh, could you please ask water what death looks like? Could you write the word death and see what water might show me? And so I already had the hydroglyph for living. And the layered meaning of that is also gratitude. And so I wrote the word death. And I got this living hydroglyph and I'm like, oh, that can't be. And I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it 50 times, and I did it more than 50 times. And I kept seeing the same glyph. I'm like, this is another meaning. So I don't think that water identifies death in the same way that we do, because water never dies. We can call it dead water. We have these terms for right, right. polluted water that hasn't got you know good structure in these things, but that's a word we've given it. But it always evaporates. This, this is super fascinating. To me, your light environment is just as important as proper nutrition and fitness, maybe even more depending on how clean your diet is. And hopefully by now, you know how brutal non-native blue light exposure is for you, especially at night after dark. The short version of why is that blue light exposure crushes your melatonin production and increases cortisol. This is a really bad idea if you're trying to get good quality sleep. I've been blue free at night in my house for many years and have scoured the internet for countless hours to try and find pure red bulbs. This is why I was so stoked to find the Lumi Sleep Plus bulbs from Blue Blocks. They are awesome and check all of the important boxes. Most importantly, they only emit red light. So no blue, green, yellow, or orange light, just pure red light, which is optimal for melatonin production. To take it a step further, they even added a converter into the bulb that lowers the EMF and reduces flicker to almost non-existent levels. Flicker is bad as it can cause neurological issues like headaches, migraines, and even photosensitive epilepsy. And here's a cool test you can do for your home lighting. Take a short video of any bulb in your house in slow motion, then watch it back to see how much your lights flicker. And if they do, I would highly recommend replacing them. And the Lumi sleep bulbs are non-dimmable as dimming a light will increase flicker and EMF rates. Plus, you don't need dimmers when the light is pure red because you want that warm, mellow light at night. So I'm just obsessed with these things. I take them with me on every trip and have them all over the house. If you want to grab some Lumi Sleep Plus light bulbs, here's what you do. Visit blueblocks.com slash lifestylist and the code lifestylist will save you 15% off your order. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com slash lifestylist. That right there, I had a realization uh, about a year ago uh, on a hunting trip, and I did a podcast about it where there's the whole story. But essentially, I hadn't been hunting since I was a little kid. It's never been my thing. But uh, as you mentioned earlier about you know the reconciliation of going to the origin of what you consume and being willing or, you know, um, to participate in that. So I went hunting and I shot this boar 
And then subsequently on that same trip, I had a psilocybin journey. And uh, during that journey, I went into exploring the phenomenon of death and and, and also just reconciling the guilt and all the stuff uh, about actually killing an animal that I was going to eat. And it, and it sounds so trite. It's hard to like deliver it with the impact with which it was delivered unto me. But essentially the boiled down, no pun intended, version of it was that death is a fallacy and that there is actually no reality that we know as death. Mm -hmm. That what we perceive to be death is just that it's the transference of form into formless. And it was so abundantly clear. And of course, I went to check myself, like, are you just rationalizing that you killed something? <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, which is another whole rabbit hole that I unpacked. But it was one of the most profound experiences of my life in that its after effect was a massive dissipation of my fear of death, right? It's just, it's not a thing. So when you say that uh, about water, not being able to actually express a non-reality, mm -hmm. right? It only sees it as life because that's that's all of there is. But from our kind of more limited and um, attached point of view we see is like you're there now you're alive and if you're not animating your body you're you're therefore dead right but we don't know that you're not still there maybe yeah. in this etheric form of water vapor or whatever that you describe we, we don't really know right it's the mystery and the unknown but that part is really fascinating to me mm. as de as exploring the idea of death not being a reality and there's different ways to die and how you die some cultures are very very you know, focused on how you die. The ancient Egyptians were very focused on how they died and what they did in this life to prepare them for the next. And many cultures are very uh, focused on that. And so when you, if, if as a hunter, for example, I'm a vegetarian, but I, I really do my best, and again, this is a conversation we had today, um, to take myself out of judgment and go into, well, if you are able to hunt and kill and eat your own food, it is an entirely different expression and experience than it is basically just going to the supermarket, buying some packaged meal food and meat and cooking it at home. And you at least in that moment are able to honor that animal and even like express gratitude for its life and uh, really help its its spirit to not be in trauma because what i see in eggs is trauma wow yeah. and if you think about how how something dies or how someone dies that's why it's so nice to be able to be surrounded by loved ones one of the things that i think is very very true is that we all creating memories. One of the things we are taught through various different bodies of water science is that water stores information. That is exactly what we do from the moment we are conceived. We store information and memories. We make memories. We began this conversation a little while ago. That is now a memory. Me just saying that is now a memory. Whenever we look back at our life, we are remembering our lives. Everything is a memory. So at the very end of your life, and my amazing, beautiful um, godfather, Dino, passed last year, and we spoke nearly every single day for going on 20-something years. And what he did for me was leave an amazing memory in my heart. And I think one of the greatest gifts we can do is really leave beautiful memories in the hearts of others because all we ever do is create memories. And so I think it's so beautiful, actually, that we're able to do that. Even we see nature doing that. It's creating memories in the rings of trees. It creates memories in the core samples in the Antarctic. You can see in, these, in this ice, there's so much information. You know, it, it is this thing of which we're able to do and how how are we able to do all of these things when you really dive <laughs> into the area of water and consciousness you can see how beautifully 
they are married. My friend Moses Hackman, he says that water is the glove on the hand of consciousness. And I think that is a really profound way of looking at this. And as we kind of go along this journey, I've been sharing um, my work quite freely and I, I feel like um, I was invited by a lot of well-meaning people um, to really, really monetize my work and like charge a great deal amount of work, money for it, make it like the secret thing about how to do it. And I think when, whatever you do, you should always ask yourself why you're doing it in the first place. Hmm. And when I began this journey, it all happened so organically. Everything, everything I've done has come just from some kind of inspired thought. I'm like, let me just try this. Let's see what happens. You know, it hasn't ever come from a place of like, how can I monetize this to like do blah, blah, blah. Hmm. And like, because I think of water in such a profound way, I think, well, water is sh showing me something that needs to be shared. And so everything that I've done, I've made really affordable for people. And I've done just about as much pro bono stuff as I've done where people have kind of gone to learn my technique and go to my workshops and like, you know, do this. And I want to actually offer um, a course where I can teach parents who can then homeschool their children, homeschooling their children and choosing to go down that route so their children can, can see how water responds to them. And I always say when you're beginning this work, don't kind of go from zero to hero. Don't go into it expecting water to show you a face or a, you know, an image or any of those things. Like start in the beginning. This is a relationship that we're learning about, where it's very similar to human relationships, whereby you want to get to know someone. Like say you're really attracted to somebody and you ask them out and they say yes and they're attracted to you and you you go out on a date and um, you go to like a restaurant and the waiter or the waitress will come and serve you and there are lots of people having conversations around you but your focus is really on that person you're looking at the way they smile looking at their eyes listening to their voice there is so much information you're taking in by your observation of them and them of you and you really aren't have really aware even of what's going on around you. You're just your focus is there. So in the early the early days of relationship, and as you get to know someone better, you become a lot more relaxed. They get to know all your little idiosyncrasies. Like if you don't put the lid on things <laughs> too tight, like that's me. Oh my god, <laughs> that is so funny. When we were driving last night, Allison handed me her little reishi chocolate drink and i took some of it and she's like oh i want the rest save me some and i said sure and i handed it back and she went to shake it <laughs> yeah. up and it went all over the car <laughs> she's like, why don't you put the lid on because you said you're about to drink it what yeah it's hilarious it's a real thing yeah um and, and we have this and then even within families you know families they don't care if your hair is perfect or if like you wake up and your breath's could kill a goat or something. Nobody's caring about those kinds of things. And this is what I've observed in my relationship with water. Water teaches me about love. Love, water really is the elixir of love in, the, in, this, in many ways. And that you don't, your focus, your relationship with the external expression of love, which is to me water, it's showing you Firstly, it's transparent. It's non-judgmental. It will go into the body of an ant as easily as it will go into the body of a king or a beggar. You know, it, it really doesn't carry any judgment. And within those expressions, we have a choice to be also that way. And what I see with teaching people how to do this work is just observe water first. Observe the patterns it normally makes. Then when it feels right, maybe get a singing bowl and, and play, put that water in there and play it and then see how it's changed. See that you've done something to it that has made it energetically moved. You've moved it. We understand what it feels to be moved. We only need to listen to a piece of music that just makes us feel something, gives us goosebumps, like all those things, this wave comes through us of emotion. 
And I always think of tears actually being emotion that we can feel and see and taste and touch. And if eyes are the windows to the soul, then tears are an expression of spirit. And so as people start forming relationship, what you start to see is that water starts to become responsive. It starts to feel safe. It starts to show not only pictures, but it starts to create in these hydroglyphs and you start seeing messages. And then as your relationship develops, it's just like being with a spiritual teacher. You know, you start to really observe that there is so much more here and there is so much depth and it's always a reflection of yourself. It's, it's so decentralized, this work, because it's not all about me having this amazing relationship with water and people call me the water whisperer and all this stuff, but so much about my work and this work and water's work with me is that I'm just simply showing the world what water is showing me. Have you heard of colostrum? Well, it's been one of my top superfoods for the past decade. It's likely one of the best tasting and definitely most nutrient dense and novel foods on the planet. My personal colostrum of choice has always been Sir Thrival. They sent me their three new flavors of colostrum this week, and of course I immediately opened all three jugs and made a drink of each with only spring water as the base, and they were insanely good, just rich, creamy, delicious. I'm now, of course, obsessed. The new flavors are enhanced with organic cacao powder, strawberry juice powder, and organic vanilla. And I gotta say, even their plain, unflavored colostrum was already addictively delicious, so the new flavors are, for me, just an added bonus. What I like about colostrum, in addition to it being such a delicious ingredient in just about any smoothie you can dream of, is that it also provides protein and immune factors in their natural whole food form. So much so, in fact, that it's often referred to as immune milk. And for those of you that like studies, the studies have shown that colostrum is three times more powerful than the vaccine against flu virus. So this might just be nature's best pandemic prevention supplement. Plus, it also aids digestion and is often used in cases of leaky gut, IBS, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. And Sir Thrival has set the standard for the highest quality USA-sourced grass-fed colostrum available. You can think of Sir Thrival colostrum as a supercharged protein powder, but more functional and sophisticated but not so sophisticated that kids won't eat it. In fact, kids actually love it. And when I have one, this will likely be the first food they eat after mom's milk. You can get your colostrum now at surthrival.com and use the code Luke for 10% off your order. That's S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-A-L. Surthrival, like survive and thrive at the same time. Surthrival.com, and again, the code is Luke. And each person can have a relationship with by just getting a petri dish. Have most people have a have a phone with a camera on it and a freezer. You don't need any expensive equipment or any of these things. All I teach you is kind of the the ins and outs of um, of people like ask me like, does my freezer have to be like empty? And like, do I have to get into the Zen space and all these kinds of things? Firstly. Your freezer is usually full of frozen food and anything that is frozen is in a kind of state of suspension. It's not giving in or giving out energy. Oh, interesting. So you're not going to get like chicken nugget no. shaped water. No, you, you, don't, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, because people really worry about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but also a lot of people think that they need to be in a like a really zen space. And that also then comes back to relationships. If you can, if your real life allows you to be in a beautiful meditative space with, you know, incense and candles or whatever is going on, and that then you have water in that space, I mean, water's going to love that, of course, because people love to be in that space. It's nice to decompress and relax. But in real life, in real relationship, especially for me, I have three children. Actually, three doctors told me that I would never be able to have children after having that car accident I talked about. Wow, so I had wow. a child for every doctor that told me I couldn't because I hate being <laughs> told what I can't do. And it also, it was important for people to get, I guess, hear sometimes, you know, you have a choice in the moment that you're told you have something. 
or that you can't do something. You have a choice to go to believe it and completely go down that and and feel that and, and that be your truth. Or you can just put it on the shelf and go, well, who knows? You don't, you know, it's like we don't have to believe everything we're told and we don't have to believe everything we read. It really is so ex- Everything we feel, we we experience, what we experience in the world becomes our perception of it. And so, you know, that's why I feel like we really live, we have these two worlds in this world we live in. Is, there's so much going on in this world. And it's very unique. And so we, we, we do have choice. We do have choice of perception. Like I really love um, Viktor Frankl, the uh, man's search for meaning. And it really being about not just looking for happiness, but really looking for meaning. Because meaning means that when you are passion driven, when you are living a life that you feel has purpose and meaning, you know, in those days you don't want to get up and you just feel tired and you want to lie in and do all of that. There's a there's a purpose behind getting up. There's a reason for it. And Truth is, we don't always feel happy. We can feel content, which is like actually one of the most amazing feelings to to every day have a feeling of contentment. But when you're in a world of chaos, at least you have a choice to actually have some order within yourself. You, it's very difficult when when we're seeing so much crazy stuff going on in the world, and there's many things that many of us are not happy with. But within this realm of water, what I keep seeing is when I am frustrated, when I'm angry, water won't design anything with me. It's not because it doesn't want to. It's because I don't think that water actually resonates at a, at a frequency in, that is in that kind of more dense space. What I think actually is that even if I'm sad, water will respond very beautifully with me. There's a lot of, there's compassion there, but it just will not, if I'm stupid enough (laughs) to just think that it's a good idea to do some crystallography after I've just been like in heaps of traffic and the children have been driving me crazy or something, and I think, oh, I'll just do this crystallography now. I mean, it just won't work. It it won't do it (laughs) at all. And actually, wow. there is a, a lady that's working with me now. She um, lives in Slovenia. And she said, and I have this private Facebook group for people that are actively using my technique and sharing their work. There's about 300 people in it. And you have to have my technique to be able to be in the group because I want to make sure everybody's doing the same thing. Um, and there's some incredible stuff being shared in there. And that's what's exciting. What excites me most is seeing other people do this and seeing how their relationship with themselves and other people and the natural world and water shifts and changes. And she she started sharing in this group, this lady. And I reached out to her because she shared this image of uh, dogs, her dogs appeared in the ice. I wanted to, really wanted to know about that. And she said, well, Firstly, six months prior, she'd been using my technique. This was before hydroglyphs ever came into being. And she said, you know, she wasn't seeing anything um, incredible, but she did it every day for six months. I'm like, wow, you are just an inspiration. (laughs) Most people would have given up ages ago. And she said, no, I felt there was something really to this. And she'd also gone through an emotional, some emotional stuff and kind of had come out the other end. And she said, all of a sudden she started getting imagery like like mine. And so the story behind what she saw is that she had asked water to show her some tulips. And so, but all week she'd been worried about her dog. She had had two dogs, one who had died and one that was going through some sickness. And one was like an Afghan and one was a whippet, is a whippet. And they're very specific looking dogs. And so when she froze the ice, asking it to show her these tulips, what it did was show her her two dogs, one bigger dog and one smaller dog. And she was like, but it didn't show, 
at me like these big tulips. And as she went looking, there were these teeny tiny tulips in the ice, but it showed her the dogs. And she said, I asked it to show me tulips, but all week she was thinking about her dogs. And I said, well, water doesn't do small talk. It doesn't want to just show you that it's a photocopier. It's showing you that it sees you. It, you are, it is a mirror. Whenever you think about water and we look into a puddle, someone uh, actually suggested this idea. So, you know, we see ourselves looking into the water, but what if water is also seeing us? And there is this kind of um, interaction going on. And so <laughs> she, she was so blown away by that. And I see that a lot. There's one lady who in this group um, who had lost her cat. And she was like, I, I, didn't, I mean, in New Zealand, cats just live outside when they can go and do whatever they want at night. There's nothing's going to kill them. And, but here in America, it's not so safe. And there's coyotes and Lots stuff coyotes, going yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. And so she was really worried. I'd been missing for three or four days. And she asked You guys don't water, have coyotes? We don't have anything that will kill you in New Zealand. Really? No, Australia has everything over okay. there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but anyway, so she asked the water, if, is my cat even still alive? Like, where is it? And she shared the picture. And there's this arrow pointing to what looks like some part of her garden. And, but it also pointed to the hydroglyph for living. And so I reached out and I said, well, you know, what I see, I'm just telling you what I see, whether it's, I don't, I don't know, but the arrow is pointing to a, um, a hexagon, which essentially means living. And so maybe I think it's saying your cat's alive. And then the next day the cat appeared and the cat was just a bit thinner, but the cat was alive. <laughs> and one of the most interesting ones was this man taught his daughter how to do this work and shared her crystallography. And in the crystallography was a ladder, which is the hydroglyph for stairway or to climb up. Um, there was the hydroglyph um, for danger, which is the dagger, and there were two daggers. And there was the hydroglyph for rise up, which is a long leaf shape. And so when you put all of that together, essentially the meaning is to be careful climbing or rising up something. So it was before I shared about this hydroglyphs and I said, you know, listen, I've been doing this work. Could you just tell your daughter to just be a little bit careful if she's climbing up something? And he got back to me within seconds and he wrote, lol. He said, tomorrow we're going to this place called Go Ape where we're going to be climbing up these rope ladders and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I'll make sure to tell her to be careful. And so... I've seen that quite often where water can show you stuff that's about to happen and water can show you something from a hundred years ago. Oh my God. Where literally I've gone oh to a spring God, where there was a lot of Maori Crazy. settlement in New Zealand, right? And I collected um, some water from that area. And when I froze it, the image was one of my favorite images actually, where there was this uh, house that looked like it was on stilts but it had a very specific look about it. And I thought, you know what, that looks like a Maori pātaka, which is like a food storage hut that they used to build on stilts. And so I went going through historical books in that area, and there was this um, historical sketch of a pātaka that looked like you could have almost put the ice image on top of it, and they were just so similar. And so this is like incredible to me because water is showing me something that it's like almost a memory or a resonance or a bioresonance from a period of time where they would actually take gourds and store the water in them and sometimes store them in these food storage huts. And so, I mean, there's many different stories that I could share about water sharing me things that were about to happen. Um, but then going into the realm of spirit perhaps might be something which is also interesting because my mother, who was literally a walking angel on this planet, um, she passed in 1999 and we would write letters to each other um, when I lived in Japan. And this was before cell phones and computers and all this kind of thing. And at the end of every letter, 
my mother would attempt to draw a circle because her circles were really bad and they always looked like misshapen rotis. And in the middle of that, she would draw a heart. And so I said to Water, can you connect to my mum? And I got this misshapen circle with a heart in the middle. And in every, every um, year now on her birthday, I'll ask the same question and I see the same image appear in the eyes. And I think what it suggests is really that thing we talked about, how water really doesn't identify death in the same way that we do. And we, we talk about this, the, the veil, you know, between realms and between worlds. And even the concept of a veil is this kind of a mist. And after speaking to so many people also who have had near-death experiences, and I've also had one myself, I would say, um, whereby there is this knowing that this essence of who we are simply transmutes into a into a different phase into a different state and within that state we are really observing things we are having an experience still so we we identify so much with the body because we we see it we feel it we touch it but when we touch it like what's really going on in that experience <laughs> If you touch yourself, there is the sensation of touch. You know, we're again feeling everything within this fluid system. And I think with the egg, egg tests, you know, where we can see that just by in proximity there can be healing, I think that if we think about what Bruce Lee said, Bruce Lee was amazing. And as so many people have heard and quoted, you know, he says, be like water. Water becomes the cup, it becomes the teapot. And he's saying to be like water, but actually, who knows what water is like? I'm pretty sure he knew what water was like. It doesn't just enter something to become something. You know, water has all of these qualities of which we can actually really identify with in very beautiful, harmonious, uh, non-judgmental and spiritual ways and by seeing it in this way and if you think of your body as a container there have been great people in this world that have graced this world saints um, uh, enlightened people and my teacher he told me that people that are divine um, have divine energy that completely fill the container of the human, then that energy, that vibration, that frequency will touch people that they will never, ever meet. You know, people talk about how can I change the world? Like what can I do when the world is just so crazy and all this? And it, it's an inside job. You know, if we simply recognize ourselves as divine temples of water and that we ourselves really have the community community within the cells of just the most incredible source like water to me is not a resource it is source as I've mentioned before and we have the ability to communicate with this like spark of life within us this um, beautiful kind of um, essence within us, we have the ability to really fill this body with such beautiful divinity that doesn't come from a place of ego, that doesn't come from a place outside of ourselves. We're given this gift of life on purpose and we are able to share that energy. It doesn't matter if you can't walk. It doesn't matter if you can't see. It doesn't matter if we have all of these issues. The point of that is that we have a choice to, to be free, to express what it is to feel and be divine. You know, that doesn't have to be, come, that should never come from some place of ego. That comes from a fact. You know, in that accident I told you about, um, 
there was, I was in the Christchurch earthquakes. There was some really big, terrible earthquakes in New Zealand that happened. The day before the second one, I was sharing the story about the car accident to my friend that had come down to see me to Christchurch because that's where it was. And my son, Rama, who was nearly three, and I've never shared that story with him. I mean, it's not usually something you share with little children. Um, he was hiding behind a, the cupboard, and he, I didn't know he was there, and he was listening to the whole conversation. Huh. And then, as children do, they know this, they're very sneaky. And so he, after I finished talking about it, he jumped out, he jumped on my lap, and he said, I remember that, mummy. He said, I remember coming down out of the clouds and I went like this and I saved you. And when I knew you were okay, I climbed back up the ladder into the clouds. He said he even remembered the window wipers and the tires. And in those moments when I think about my, my little guy, <laughs> oh my, God. my little Rama, Rama the charmer, <laughs> and you think about what we don't know. We don't know so much. But in this world and in this life that we're so blessed to have, I think we can rest assured that we are meant to be and that there wasn't a mistake. No matter how awful your childhood might have been, no matter what you might have been told, you were not a mistake. And that's what I keep seeing in water. Water keeps reminding me, seeing me. I, I had this amazing guy. John is part of the group that is helping us discover more layers of hydroglyphs. And he's fortunate enough to be able to set an intention and then um, freeze the water outside because he lives somewhere where it's so cold, he's actually able to see it freeze, not, not in a freezer, which is fabulous because it suggests wow. it's not the freezer that's cool. setting that's yeah, making yeah. it happen. Yeah. And it is like his, his images are amazing. And he keeps seeing what we call the, the um, creation glyph which are like these little seeds and all these waves that take up the entire Petri dish. It's one of my favorite, most beautiful um, images. And he kept getting it over and over and over again. He said, I just don't know what water's trying to tell me. And he's a, a biodynamic farmer and he is like always helping seed, he's planting seeds and they're growing. This is, he's seeing creation. He's seeding creation all the time. And he sees this, he saw this work as just so incredibly beautiful. And I said, well, how does it feel to you if water is showing you a reflection of yourself, showing you that in this space you are the creator and you have appreciation for the creation? And I think it's very important to look at the relationship between creator and created. It's a very special relationship that we have. And he was saying, yeah. And I said, what if you're really, it's showing you how special you are. And he said, oh, yeah, but everybody's special in their own way. He said, I don't know how I could be that special. And I think that's a problem so many of us have. The idea that we could be that special, mm -hmm. that water is seeing us and reflecting us in such profound ways it's almost hard for people to accept how, how beautiful we are. It's, I mean, I'm coming from the same place. I struggle. You know, I'm, I'm in a relationship with the most incredible man of my life that I could be so blessed to have, um, have found again. But we have a big age gap. And within that, and I'm older than him, and talk about confronting. You know, if you, if I stay in the space of feeling like, am I pretty enough? Am I young enough? Uh, you know, am I this enough? Am I that enough? All the things that so many women question about themselves. You know, there's so much insecurity that comes with how we perceive ourselves in the way that we look. And it's so real. That's so real for so many people, men and women. And Yet when I go into a space where it's, it's really the water space, you know, it's that space of creation where, where we are able to identify ourselves as a divine spark, as a 
expression of something that is meant to be. And in that space, I don't care about all that stuff. What I see when I'm with him is someone who is worthy, is someone who is loved for exactly how I can be. He is that safe space container for me to be whatever I need to be in. And in that space, it's amazing because I can be four seasons in one day, of which he would tell you that I am. <laughs> <laughs> and he is mostly sunny. But the depths that we can go to together in those spaces where I'm not like caught up in, in caring about what other people might think or what I think about any insecurity that I might have or, or he might have, we are learning to create together. And when you start even delving into realms where, you, where intimacy is involved, you know, we talk about intimacy sometimes very in a frivolous kind of way. But when you, when you think about even just drinking water, you are inviting something to enter your mouth and enter inside of you and then become you. That's just drinking water. Like then you take it to another level and then you have intimacy between two conscious bodies of water which are electrical, which absorb light from each other, which share information. This is really the kind of idea of Kundalini where you are sharing intimacy that moves itself, entwines itself, shares itself to create something new. And creating something new doesn't have to be a child. Creating a new energy is like the vortex of life, where two people come together and breathe together and share together and consciously intertwine in this world of fluidity. And when you're in those spaces, it can take you to places that plant medicines and all of these other things are not even necessary. You are actually truly able to embody something completely um, spiritual in its essence. And when you align with someone whose desire for that is the same as yours, and you kind of merge in that space, there is no form, there is no you or me, there really is no um, things that are confining you. You simply are in that space of uh, truth. And it's so unique and it's so incredibly profound. And I think that when we're in those spaces, sometimes it, it's, it's not even sexual. Sometimes it can just be the breath. That's so intimate. Sometimes like just seeing each other. If you look at someone for long enough, you'll see them. So often people cry when they are held for longer than two minutes. People are not used to being held or hugged or seen anymore. And when we take time to really look at someone, like really see them, you're not looking at the body, you're looking at them. We're not this physical. We are in some ways, of course, we see this physical, but we're so much more than that. Like really, like, you know, when you really see someone, you feel them, you feel who they are. And it doesn't matter what they've done or what they look like or any of those things because all we really have is this moment. Everything else is a memory or everything else is imagination. All we really have is now. And in those spaces, there is the truth. There is the freedom and there is the love. Damn. Oh my God! You're talking about this guy, right? That guy there. <laughs> that is so beautiful. Thank you. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this moment.
bhaktis really are an expression of spirit. Yeah, the tr- it's it's if we weren't actually making a podcast, I would just sit here and enjoy the, <laughs> the silence between us and the the beautiful um, etheric realm that you just I don't want to say manifested, but just acknowledged. Right? Yeah. It's like we don't even have to create moments of magic and and love and connection. It's it's really almost just relinquishing or surrendering that which is obscuring it. Yeah. It's just. It's this is always here, right? It is. And honestly, this is this is why I say water is like the elixir of love. Cause you know, even through conception, it's it's incredibly informed water merging together. Oh my god, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And everything in life that is conceived is conceived through some kind of fluid. It's held within some kind of fluid. Even frog eggs, they're in this kind of gel. You know, all life comes from some fluid. And there is information in that fluid. And I think there is ancestral information in that fluid. And these things, I mean, even in, in our mother's stomach, the, there is so much information that is being so absorbed. And these, these watery realms, you know, there's so there's there's so much for us. There is so much for us in this world. And for even the people that can't go very far or travel or they're confined, they feel confined. I often do this, well, soon I, I haven't done it actually for a while, but it's nice to talk about. When I had my wellness center, uh, I would talk people through this little kind of meditation whereby I said to them, I'd like you to imagine that in your hand you hold this little boat. It's like a, an open boat, like a little dinghy. I don't know if you call them anything yeah, different no, in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we have uh, dinghies. Okay. <laughs> so, so many words in New Zealand we use, and it's yeah. like often uh, people have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, so it's like this little dinghy. And inside the, this little boat, and it, that can be any color you like, and inside the boat you, there's, you put a candle. But it's not lit yet. And you need to know that when you light the candle, it can, can't go out no matter what. Whether it's in water, nothing can happen to it. The light will always stay on. So I say to them, like, light the candle. And now hold this little boat with the candle that's got the flame. And walk your way through this forest. And at the, on the floor of the forest is this beautiful soft moss and you don't have shoes on, you can feel, you can see your footprints going down, you know, some of that moss can be so thick and soft and you're walking through this forest and you can see all this dappled light and there's a little deer that kind of looks at you and then kind of moves off and you can hear the rustling of the trees and you kind of just walk through this forest and you can see the light of your candle and you're holding this boat that seems kind of like, why am I holding a boat? But it doesn't matter. And you go through and after a while you can hear some water running and as you start to make your way through, you come to this clearing and in the clearing there is this beautiful stream and there's a tiny little waterfall and there's these big rocks around the stream and one of them is really big and wide and flat and the sun has been like beating on it and it looks super comfortable because you've been in this kind of darker space of the forest and so you put your little boat with with the candle inside down for just a minute and it's fine it's safe and you put your stomach onto this rock and you feel this beautiful heat on your chest and it's so lovely and you look into the water. And when you look down into the water, the water is beautiful and clear. And you see this tiny little fish darting around. And you see the little colors that are from the pebbles that are inside of the water. And then when you're ready, you can just move over and pick your little boat up with the candle. And then you place it without letting it go. You just place it into the water and you can feel it wants to go. And then when it feels right for you, you just let that little boat go and you see the boat moving down and around on its organic way, taken by the water, trusting that your light will never go out. And you watch it go down this little waterfall and you see, yes, the light's still going. 
And then you see it go around a corner into this darker area of forest you haven't been to. And then I invite you to, in your mind's eye, follow it. And as you follow it, you can see that the light is shining brighter because you're in a darker, denser part of this forest. And then you feel it's starting to cool down because it's starting, the light's starting to go down, it's starting to get dark. And you hear the birds kind of moving to go into the trees and nestle in for the night. And after a while, all you can really see is this little light. Huh. And you see it go down into this like pool. And that's, you know, that the pool is deep and dark and, and beautiful and it's surrounded by forest, but you can't see of any of that anymore. And as you're looking at your little light, and you're seeing it, and you know that it's like surrounded by all these things, but you can't see any of that. I, I say, like, now look up and look up and see the moon and the stars, and see that your little light is every bit as bright and beautiful as all of this incredible lights in the universe. And recognize that in that moment. And then I say, now take your little boat with your candle and look at the candle. And turn that candle, that, that light white. And then imagine that that white light is actually encapsulating your entire body. And really see the outline of your body in this beautiful kind of vibrant white light. And see the outline, really see the outline of your body. And then I say the most important thing now is to then take away the outline. And you see that actually, then light just expands. Light is such an incredible thing that we don't need to be this held within this container that we see as the physical. When you fill that container with light and you take the outline away, then all there is is light, and light does what it does. It expands. It shines. We're so afraid to shine. It's so comfortable to not shine. But the brighter that we can be, actually, it's interesting. When I take it back a little bit, this indigenous woman once said to me, she said, you know, um, I used to, she, she could speak to bees. She said she could communicate with bees and she would watch the bees in their hive. And she said um, that she would watch them for hours and hours and hours. And then a bee came out and said to her in its own way, it said, um, I, we don't mind you looking at our hive, but please don't look at it for hours on end because your consciousness is putting too much light in the hive. Wow. And then that really oh like God. made a trigger for me because I'm like, oh, if consciousness puts light into what we focus on, that makes sense in relationship to light and water. So when you form this kind of relationship and you put your conscious expression towards this water within the work that I'm working with, then there is this invisible bond that happens. And even in the very practical sense of easy water being able to absorb more light, when your conscious expression is expressed within this uh, watery realm, that is because I've taken a very important photograph where you see this shoot of ice coming out, but around it is this like a light, like a halo, like an aura. And I think that water uses light to design. And the more light it can absorb, the more it can design. And if you're consciously aware of that water, you're giving it more light to help to create. And even in various texts and things like that, I mean, it does says um, that God spoke upon the waters. And really, what's exactly what we're doing? We're speaking upon water, and then we are seeing creation happen. We're going from the impersonal to the personal, the invisible to the visible, from the unseen to the seen, from molecular chaos to molecular order. It's very interesting. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's so good. So good. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And God, I'm just like, I'm sitting here just basking in all of this and unpacking it as you speak. It's just really, I love your perspective and 
Yeah, just the way that you see things and share them is so beautiful. I think this is going to be a really impactful um, conversation for many people. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's just so, and I'm glad you got to touch on light because there was one thing in my notes I I wanted to to speak to that a little bit, but um, I think we've covered everything I could have ever dreamt of <laughs> and more. I want to remind people that uh, you can find the show notes at lukestory.com slash veda, V-E-D-A. And we'll definitely be putting some of your work in there. Uh, I think in closing, perhaps you could outline what you have going currently in terms of people learning how to do this themselves. You mentioned the Facebook group. And I, I perused your site when I first found you. I haven't been on there in a while. Yeah. But if somebody you know wanted to start um, exploring this realm themselves, what what would be a good thing for them to do to start that? Yeah. Well, what I will say is I made everything super affordable. So I don't want people, the reason for not doing this work is because they can't afford it. So people can get my PDF from my website, which just is the step-by-step guide how to do the technique. Um, you can get the list of hydroglyphs there. So if you're not if you're not seeing imagery, you might see actual more sophisticated messages. Um, you can get them together. You can get the whole bundle of my dreams study that I've also shared and a whole study on salt, which I really think is amazing. Personally, I love the whole synergy of salt and water. Um, and that's on my website, which is vedaaustin.com. And also um, I do workshops where it's a Zoom workshop where people can come on and I teach them and I help them with their freezing settings and like timing and knowing how to look for those two stages of water. Um, and on Instagram, vedaaustin underscore water and on Facebook. And um, and I share lots and lots of videos actually on my website and I share my... I've watched some of those. Very, yeah. very cool. Yeah, you have an, an incredible library on your site. I think a lot of people that do video and, and visual work will, will just put it on their social media and you go to their site, you're where's all that stuff? But you have a really vast library of all your work on there, which is very cool. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been doing it for so long and I'm right, so right. like uh, prolific, really. <laughs> there's yeah. not usually a day it's been a few days now because we've been traveling but there's not usually a day that doesn't that goes by where i don't do this work hey do you think um if you oh hey there's the wife come on in oh look at the doggy yeah wife and doggy hi cookie <laughs> oh boy what a what a welcome wagon come on we're, we're just about to wrap up hey, honey baby yeah. Hi. No worries. <laughs> that's, Hi, a, that's, a, that's a great uh, finale for our conversation here. Hi, honey. Yeah, new friend. Oh, my goodness. I wanted to ask you. She doesn't even know where to go. She's so pumped. Hi. Hey, so so our, our friend at Alive Waters that makes these, these um, Flower of Life vessels, do you think it's likely that if you took some water in this glass and put it in one of your Petri dishes and froze it, it would show something like this? Oh, I've done, I've used this. I've, now I know it's the same person. Yeah. The beautiful round container that I've got. I've crist, I've done the crystallography of it and it showed like a flower of life. Wow. It was really, really cool. Oh so I'll send God. it to you. That's awesome. Yeah. I got, I'll send it to Chris. I mean, you guys should know each other, I feel, anyway, because he's, yeah. he's such a, you know, water fanatic. He's now the steward of findaspring.com, which was started by another friend of ours, Daniel Vitalis, who's one of the guys that kind of helped me get back into spring water collecting many years ago after having kind of lost it um, for, as a kid. I used to go with my grandma. So yeah, there's a there's a great um, synergy there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, thank you so much. It's this has been just beautiful, incredible. I'm so glad we we're able to sit down in person too. Me too. This wouldn't have been the same across the waters. <laughs> 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 so thank you so much. Thank you, Allison, for coming by and gracing us in the <laughs> finale here. So good to see you. Uh, we were, we were, man, this was a good one, honey. We we're, we we're getting into some, some real heavy stuff there in the best sense. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, I think that's it. Safe travels to you until I see you again. Thank you. As we bring episode 410 featuring Veda Austin to a close, I want to remind you that show notes as well as some images of Veda's work can be found at lukestory.com slash Veda. Man, I am just so grateful that I not only had the opportunity to record this episode, but uh, more than anything to share it with you. I just think that her work and her perspective is so deep and so fascinating. And um, I think the world needs more magic, you know, it's, it's all there. Maybe we don't need more magic, but perhaps 
we're being provided with uh, opportunities to become more aware of the magic that is in fact present. So thank you for listening. Thank you to our guest, Veda. I was so happy to be able to um, sit down with her in person after following her work and uh, just got lucky that she happened to be passing through Austin and was able to visit the studio. So super cool stuff for me. And uh, I trust that if you're still listening to my voice right now, it's cool for you too. Let's thank our sponsors, Leela Quantum. And you can find those guys at uh, leelaq.com. Also, we've got Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. That's Organifi with an I. Blueblocks.com slash Lifestylist. B-L-U-B-L-O-X. Highly recommend their red light bulbs and awesome sleep mask and different things that they're working on over there. And then uh, last but certainly not least, a brand that I've been using for ages. I mean, I don't know, maybe 10, 12, 15 years or something. Quite a long time. As long as they've been around, I think. And that brand is SirThrival.com. These guys have all sorts of good stuff. The pine pollen extract, the colostrum, uh, reishi, chaga extracts, of course, their radical energy drink, and uh, all kinds of cool stuff over there. So thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for supporting the sponsors. Uh, If you don't want to spend any money on any of the sponsors, totally cool. Totally respect that. What would be really great perhaps even beyond supporting the sponsors, is to just share the specific episodes of The Lifestylist that you listen to and enjoy with some of your friends. You know, it used to be really difficult on the apps, the podcast apps, that is, to share specific episodes. I remember it used to drive me crazy on the Apple app, you know, the little purple logo. Uh, And you'd go and click around and you'd find the share uh, tab. And then it would just share that podcast as a whole. Um, not specific episodes. And they finally figured out a way to make it possible to share a specific episode with someone. So uh, I use Overcast and a couple of different other podcast apps, depending on which shows I'm listening to. And as far as I know, all of them have made it really easy to share specific episodes. And uh, if you feel called to do that uh, for this episode of any or any future episode of The Lifestylist, um, just know that I and our guests are extremely grateful to be able to get this information out and share it with the world. It's uh, not only my joy, but also my passion. And uh, for the time being, a huge part of my purpose. So thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Cameron George, where we talk about kava and the current state and perhaps future of psychedelics and plant medicines, um, legal and otherwise. And uh, next week's show, 411, is is a really, uh, another deep, episode, if I don't say so myself. Uh, Very, very cool guy. Cameron's been on the show a couple times before. You might know his company, True Kava, T-R-U. He's just, you know, he's a Kava expert. He's been on a couple times talking about that. Um, So when we sat down this time, there was like no plan. I mean, I figured we would probably mention Kava because it's such a great um, and useful tool, but we really ended up just talking about consciousness and integration of spiritual experiences and just had a great time. So make sure you subscribe to the show so you don't miss next week's episode 411 with Cameron George. Until then, be well, and I'll be right back in your eardrums on Tuesday. Mm